Hello, this is Scott Arnold from First Baptist Church of Los Angeles welcoming you to the Bible Study Sunday School on Revelation. We're in chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, looking at the church of Laodicea. Uh, let's <laughs> take a moment now. <laughs> let's take a moment now to pray and ask for God's blessing in this uh, time that we study this word. We thank you, God, for the blessing of your care. Thank you for this word that speaks to us uh, and reminds us that we are called to be, uh, indeed, uh, in your grace and in your truth and alive by your Holy Spirit, and that we are not to be lukewarm, but to be refreshingly cool or uh, warm and hot and filled with your spirit. Uh, Lord, indeed, we are called to uh, be uh, your blessing in this world to those around us. And we are called to receive the work of your grace. Uh, we ask that we'll be faithful, the church in these days, not to be led astray, not to give uh, in to false narratives and stories or prophecies, but gracious God, that we look forward to the coming reign Lord Jesus, of you as our King of Kings, and that we uh, indeed reflect your grace, truth, love, and, and we, we pray all this in your name, gracious God, and in the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, so we're looking here at uh, the church of Laodicea. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who will look at the uh, letters of the churches and think of the church at different epics of time and history. Well, that's one way of looking at it. It's not really the way these letters were intended. They were for all the churches then, and they're for all the churches now. It really wasn't a setup of Jesus talking about a historical timeline and looking at each church as a sequential uh, element of time in the history of the church. Although some people have done that, it really, that's putting a grid on these letters that doesn't belong there. Each of these churches heard all of these letters. And so every church now should hear all of these letters and learn from them, learn from what Jesus has to say. And here Jesus will uh, be issuing forth some tough love, much as he did in each of these letters. And of course, you know, the church of Laodicea is in a city uh, that was well-to-do. Uh, it was a wealthy city. As a matter of fact, uh, when there was a time uh, when the Roman Empire was sending forth funds and resources to help rebuild cities and for improvements, the city of Laodicea said, we don't need your help. We're okay here. <laughs> Imagine that. So there was this attitude among the people of Laodicea that they were doing very well, and uh, there was a pride, there was really a sense of self-sufficiency, there was a wealth that they had for a variety of reasons, um, both in terms of their production of textiles, uh, their production of healing uh, balms and, and ointments and and a lot of, it was a very productive city in terms of commerce, and so it was a wealthy city. Um, but they had one problem in Laodicea. Their water was not good. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was awful. So unlike some cities that will have a well or hot spring, you know, cold or hot water source, uh, they had to pipe in their water in Laodicea. They had to send that water down pipes, and they have even the pipes today. It has, archaeologically, they've been able to look at these pipes. And, the, and so when it started, it would be cold. And by the time it got to the city of Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Um, and another problem what were the sediments. The sediments in this water included lime, probably sulfur, maybe some iron, minerals. It didn't taste good. Not only was it lukewarm, it tasted awful. It smelled bad. So everyone complained in the city of Laodicea. It's, it's kind of uh, 
a kind of a ironic thing that while they boasted in their wealth, they could not boast in their water. <laughs> this basic thing. Um, so they every it was just a common thing that everybody complained about. I guess every every city, every state, every region has something that they can they may complain about, whatever it might be. Nonetheless, Laodicea did not have good water, um, and so this this was the, Jesus will touch into this and and contextualize uh, a message based on this common complaint that they had as citizens of the city of Laodicea. Okay, let's read this. Uh, verse 14. To the angel of the church of La in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. So the first thing we note Jesus says about who he is and what he's about to say, he says that he, he is the amen. These are the words of the amen. Amen means fulfillment. It means uh, affirmation. It means, yes, so be it. It's God's answer to our question. Jesus is the uh, amen to our prayer. He is the amen to our need. It's God's answer. Jesus is God's answer. He is God's messenger, yes, and giving us the good news, but he is also the priest who fulfilled the work of God and the grace and ministry of God for forgiveness and reconciliation. So amen. And he is the one that we trust in uh, when we have faith for the redemption of our souls. So he is the resurrection and the life, the amen. This whole matter of amen, uh, fulfillment, is something that we can trust. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan of grace, truth, redemption, salvation. And so not only are his words true, but his witness, his actions, who he is, his role as Savior, as Lord, he is the faithful and true witness, as he says. He is the faithful and true Son of God who can witness to God the Father as only a Son of God can, as his role as the one and only unique beloved Son of God is such that he can give the most faithful and true witness to who the Father is and also represent him and speak on his behalf and have the authority as we see, he goes on to say, not only is the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus is with God the Father, creator, as, a, as one who has, was part of that creation. Uh, he is involved. Um, not only was Jesus involved in the creation, Jesus is involved in the redemption. So, he has rule, 
he has authority. Jesus has authority over creation. This is why he could calm the sea. This is why he could do many things that he did to bring healing. He didn't use that authority uh, to its fullest extent uh, when he ministered on earth because there is a timing for all things. And some things don't have to be explained just through a miracle. Sometimes there's the message of forgiveness and grace that has its own import and greater value. So, so he establishes his authority and his credibility and his role as the amen. In verse 15, I know your deeds. So Jesus knows all about us and he knows about the church. And here's the problem. You're neither cold or hot. You're like the lukewarm water that you complain about. Jesus is saying, in my sight, I could complain about who you are right now. You're not, neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm. You know, you need to, you need cleansing. You need to be refreshed spiritually. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to have a passion, a warmth, a love. So you're neither cold nor hot, just like your water. Um, and so Jesus said, I wish you were either one or the other, either be on fire and, and, and you know, uh, therapeutic, like a nice warm drink, or be refreshing and, and cool and, and offering uh, relief um, to those around you. But you're neither. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, neither healing or refreshing, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, much like the water that you drink. <laughs> Sometimes you go, oh, yeah, this water should, this water needs to change. Oh, you know, George, drink your water. <laughs> but mom, do I have to? <laughs> anyway, so you say, I am, verse 17, so you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. He's quoting people of the day of the city who were basically saying to themselves and even saying to their neighbors, we're okay here. We don't need help. Oh, we've got it together. We have what we need and more so. If so, why not even help the poor? Well, so they say, I am rich. I've acquired wealth, and it's, it's that self-sufficiency. It's even not giving due and recognition and gratitude to God. You know, we're here uh, in a time of this pandemic where we recognize there's so many things we had taken for granted, so many things that we had plentiful, and now we are recognizing we have uh, what we have, what we need, but there's people who are finding it difficult to make men ends meet. And we do feel a sense of deficiency. We're not really as rich as we thought we were. We really are spiritually more poor, or maybe even more relationally poor than we realized. Um, you say I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. That is just foolishness. That's really the kind of way that people begin to dismiss their need for God and for one another. Uh, that's not good. So Jesus says, but you do not realize that you, in fact, you're wretched. You, you're not really that happy. You're pitiful. You, you don't, if you were to really see yourself for who you are, you realize you're not living for anything significant. What is the point of your life if you if you're not if you're not having faith, if you're not sharing what you have or grateful for what you have or or you know just you know living where you think you've got it together when in fact that's not really the case. You're pitiful without that spiritual strength in life. You're you're like that lukewarm water. It's pitiful. 
That water is pretty pitiful. It not only is lukewarm, it stinks. <laughs> if you were to, you know, judge your life on what you have, ultimately what you own is going to, you know, rust or bust or turn to rust. Uh, it's pitiful, that kind of vanity. In fact, you're poor spiritually. In fact, relationally, you're poor. Uh, you're blind of your own real need spiritually or relationally. And you're naked, really. You think you're clothed in, in you know, great, beautiful garments, but in the eyes of God, you're, you, you have nothing. You're not, gar you're not clothed in the garments of salvation and the garments of righteousness. So what, what, do, what is there? It's, it's nothing, really. So in verse 18, Jesus says, I counsel you, listen carefully, I counsel you, I call you to heed this advice, uh, to buy from me gold, refined in the fire. Now, how in the world can we buy any buy something from Jesus? Well, the first thing is believe. Jesus offers us the garments of salvation. He paid the price for it. All we need to do is commit ourselves to him, humble ourselves to him. And really the cost is repentance. This is how we can receive the gift of God's grace. It's through repentance. How do we buy what Jesus has given? It's by giving our life to him, repenting of our sin, letting go of the past, letting go of what we think is so important when it's actually not important at all. Letting him show us what is good, what is gold. Letting him refine us. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich in the garments of salvation, that kind of rich, with and white clothes to wear. Um, it's interesting because the garment industry there in Laodicea, their textile industry, produced a type of dark wool, a type of dark textile. And so for Jesus to say to be dressed in white clothes is very different from what was the norm of that uh, culture and city. People were dressed in fine, dark clothing uh, that was produced there. And what Jesus is saying, what I offer you is not what the world offers. What I offer you is something spotless and clean and something uh, that is different. Uh, it's pure, a purity, uh, a sanctified uh, identification as those who've been washed clean and of their sin, uh, whose garments, their, their very souls have been washed clean and reclothed, wearing the garments of salvation. This is what will bring us to where we need to be with God. So that, he says, so you can cover your shameful nakedness without the garments of salvation you can wear what you want, but you're naked. You're vulnerable. You're subject to, um, uh, to, to being outside of that covering of grace, that covering of, of truth, uh, that covering of God's love. What God wants to do is cover us uh, in our brokenness, in our nakedness, in our... Uh, place of being distant to warming us, letting us know that we belong, that we are loved. This new garment of salvation. Um, and also Jesus says, and solve to put on your eyes so you can see. Not only does he want to cover us, he wants us to be able to see clearly. Now, there was a salve that was, uh, you know, eye ointment that was produced and was very popular and was distributed through merchants from Laodicea. So for Jesus to say he has a salve is identifying with something of their city and culture that was produced there. People uh, knew that this great eye salve 
uh, was produced there. And Jesus is saying, I want you to see spiritually. I want you to see me. I want you to see what God is doing. I want you to see with new eyes. And you can see if you take the solve that I can give you. Remember Jesus even created a solve once to a man who had been born blind. And, and he, what did he do? He spat into the dirt and the mud and he created a, a mud a solve out of his saliva and the mud and dirt. And he put it on the man's eyes. And then the man was put it on his eyes and was able to see. Um, so this is even a hint of that, what Jesus had done before. Um, and then Jesus says in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. He's saying all this because he doesn't want them to be apart from the grace of God. He doesn't want them to be a, a house divided where some are believers and some are not. He doesn't want them to be lukewarm. He doesn't want them to be close, but not really have entered into the covenant of grace and truth. He loves them. And there, there are those who are true believers and there are many who are just finding nice, fun fellowship times or, or they're interested, but they haven't committed themselves. They're lukewarm. Some are too comfortable in their wealth. Some are too comfortable thinking they've got they've got it made and and they're just but spiritually they're they're naked. Spiritually they're 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 not where they should be. They're blind. And Jesus has come to give us sight. Jesus have, has come to give, give us life and God's grace. So to those whom I love and rebuke and discipline, they're the ones I'm speaking to you, he said. So be earnest and repent. Here's the whole point Jesus is leading to. If they would but repent, that would help bring them to where they need to be. There can be no transformation, no salvation without repentance. A person can be a part of a fellowship. A person can enjoy Christian community. A person can do all that. They can hear the word. But first, uh, what must need must take place is repentance of sin, of one's nakedness, of one's brokenness, of one's need to, to say, I need you, Lord. I need you, God. I need your grace. I need your transforming love. And this is what Jesus is offering. So he says in giving this invitation, uh, of, as he calls them to repentance, he says, here I am. Verse 20, here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. We must open the door to him. I've seen different artists portray this uh, where there's a, a, a heart type door or let's say even vegetation that makes a heart around the door Anyway, and then Jesus knocking at the door, and these artists many times will portray this door as having no exterior handle, but the, the handle is on the inside for us to open. Um, but the point, of course, is that Jesus, he stands at our door. He stands each day, but until the person receives Jesus into their heart, into their life, until a person acknowledges their need, Jesus stays on the outside. He doesn't barge his way through. He invites us to open the door. We can hear him. We could think that, oh, I don't need you, Jesus, when in fact we do, every one of us. And if we do open our hearts, if we do open the door and respond to his standing there, knocking patiently. If we do respond, he will come in, come into your life, come into your heart, come in to cleanse you, forgive you, fellowship with you. Once you receive Jesus, he enters not only into your life and your heart, but he will be with you always. 
once you open your heart to him and let him minister to you, he gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you the deposit of grace that stays with you. There will be this continual communion. And so it says, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. There is a communion, there is dialogue, there's a conversation, there's something that begins that has no end. Our communion with the living God uh, takes place through Jesus Christ and, and Jesus coming into one's heart brings this communion into the place it should be and needs to be for the covenant of God to be personal and real and transformative. So where repentance leads to the kind of transformation whereby when we open the door, God begins to work through his son, Jesus Christ, and the communion we have with Jesus is a communion we have with God and with God's Holy Spirit. Um, and we eat together, we, we partake together, we talk together, we uh, share life together. That's what the table is all about, symbolically. And this is have, being at home with God, being at home with, with Jesus, letting him abide with us for now, for, from now until forever. Uh, this, is, this is the wonderful good news. And so in verse 21, to him who overcomes. And so now he's speaking to the church in a very comfortable place. You need to overcome the temptation of comfort. You need to overcome this. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus invites us to a responsibility and a participation in the work of the kingdom of God. Um, if we overcome through him, we can look forward to uh, being involved. And we now are engaged in the work of the kingdom. So part of the problem for the Laodicean church is they had become disengaged or they hadn't really engaged. So now uh, if they can overcome the, this hurdle of complacency being lukewarm, if they can either be uh, warmed and refined in, in the, the warmth of the, the Holy Spirit and become hot, or if they can become refreshing, uh, a presence, uh, either way, they can overcome their complacency. And they can look forward to the work that they are a part of for God and his kingdom. And that Jesus invites them to, to, <laughs> to sit down alongside him. That's, that's pretty interesting. That's pretty powerful. I heard Dallas Willard uh, say that we are in training for reigning. That's interesting. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And here is the conclusion of the letters of Jesus to the seven churches here in Revelation chapter 3. Next week we'll go to chapter 4, the vision before the throne of heaven. Okay, well let's take a moment to pray. Thank you God for the blessing of this day. Help us to learn from this letter. Help us to seek you daily and to trust you Lord Jesus and receive through our faith and our commitment and our repentance, what you so graciously have prepared for us. May we open the door of our hearts, um, not only um, if we have opened it before, Lord, um, may we just, even if there's someone who hasn't given their life to you, uh, that they'd open the door of their heart today. Um, but Lord, may we open ourselves to conversations with you, if we have opened that door, and to learn more of what it means to be your people and to allow your grace and your truth to lead us in these difficult times. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your name and for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Uh, God bless you.
and make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Bye-bye.